For this component, steps one, two and three are relatively easy, even easier than for the wheel hub. Now though, we're ready for step four, the modelling issues and assumptions. The tub is large, of a complex shape and made of a material which is clearly not isotropic. It is orthotropic. We'll let Lewis talk us through this step, noting the assumptions he has made along the way. The material properties that we use for the chassis are ordinarily linear again, but the data source for that is slightly different because it's a bit more of a complex problem and there are many more different types of material. They're obviously not isotropic, they're all 2D orthotropic layers which come up to build a 2D orthotropic panel and all of these have different stiffnesses depending on where they are in the car and how many layers of which material we use. So the constitutive, constitutive model we use is uh, different to that of an isotropic material and uh, we intend to use manufacturer's data for that. The material properties within the chassis are slightly different to most other components in the, um, each of the layers is a 2D orthotropic material so that's a different subset within the model when you apply them and uh, each of the layers because they can be oriented, orientated differently to one another allows you to build up different stiffnesses in different directions and that makes it more complex both from getting, getting hold of the data we require and also actually validating that against test so um, it's a little more complicated than isotropic material. Uh, this is the input method that we use in this software for actually representing the material stack with all the different plies. So if you see the spreadsheet here, there are, in this case, nine different layers. Um, within that you specify the thickness of each one and the orientation of each one. And uh, there's also a core material as well, which again is represented using a, a different kind of constitutive model. And the, uh, the clever bit, if you like, is it, it goes and works out the stiffness of that and the strength of each of those plies individually when you actually apply loads to them. For the low case we're considering for the chassis, which was a torsion test, which is to try and measure the stiffness of the car under a pure torque, we basically use the suspension components, which you can see as the yellow, yellow sticks on the screen here, and uh, they're represented using extremely simplified versions of what is really on the car, but they still obviously apply the forces in the right positions onto the chassis. And uh, from that, the loads are carried in in the correct manner, and we try and do a verification test using this very same loading method. Um, and we also only mesh half of the car essentially because any asymmetry is fairly minimal in its impact on the overall results and it saves an awful lot of time for both simplification of the cab model and also just construction of the model itself and also many of the low cases are applicable to just a half car so we tend to only run half the model just to save on computing time. And the constraint case we have here is a little more complicated than just symmetry, it doesn't really represent doing the same thing on both sides, which is what symmetry ordinarily is. It's actually trying to make the model do the opposite on one side to the other for a vertical low case. So it constrains out of the six degrees of freedom, if you count one, two, three, for the translational degrees of freedom, and four, five, and six for the rotational ones. This actually constrains, constrains one, three, and five. So in effect, it um, tries to represent anti-symmetry, which is a little complicated to explain in words, but I can show you in the model later on with the displaced shape what it actually means and what it allows and, and, and disallows in terms of ro rotations and displacements at the centre line. It comes out within maybe 2 or 3% of what is known to be the case from a full model. For the low case that we're considering here, the torsion test, uh, essentially the load is simply a vertical force applied at the contact patch here. And as you can see from there, the load travels up through my representative wheel, which is effectively just there for measuring displacements and applying the loads to the suspension members. Again, these are just representative components which are very stiff to make sure that the only uh, variable within the model in terms of stiffness comes from the chassis itself, the main body, so that year on year we get a good comparison between the effect of that component only within the system. Um, the constraints at the rear end of the car are simply the engine mounts, which we showed a little bit earlier on across the road in the, uh, on the real component, and you can see there they are just constrained in all three displacement, displacement uh, degrees of freedom. Any calculations that are made on those for strength are done using hand calculations rather than the FE model, so local stresses are ignored. And uh, the final thing is the anti-symmetry constraint on the centre line. So as you can see, this is trying to represent what happens to the overall car by just loading half of it. And to do this, it uh, effectively constrains of the six degrees of freedom if one, two and three were the translational x, y and z coordinates and 4, 5 and 6 with a rotational x, y and z, it constrains degree of freedom 1, 3 and 5 and that 
is effectively the three that you wouldn't constrain if you were doing symmetry. It's the exact opposite, which is why we call it anti-symmetry. And that does fairly accurately represent what happens during this kind of loading. It is the material behaviour that is probably the most different aspect with the chassis tub compared to the hub. The hub was made of steel, a linear, elastic, homogeneous and isotropic material requiring just a couple of numbers to be described. The material of the tub, though, has complicating features.